Hello. Welcome to this panel discussion on how the United States can best protect its interests in Afghanistan after its military withdrawal, which appears to be in its final rather painful stages. I'm George Beebe, Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for the National Interest. We have an illustrious set of experts with us today. I will introduce each of them before we get into our discussion. Uh, Milt Bearden is a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Center for the National Interest. He was actually present at the creation of the current problem, so to speak, having been the point man for the Central Intelligence Agency way back in the bad old Cold War days when the United States first decided to provide covert support to the Afghan Mujahideen who are fighting against Soviet invaders. Cheryl Bernard is a former RAND Corporation analyst with many years of experience dealing with the Afghan problem uh, as uh, a counterterrorism expert uh, and as head of uh, Arch International, her, her current role, which is an organization that protects cultural heritage sites in crisis zones. Anatole Levin is a senior fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. His involvement in the region goes back to his days as a journalist in the 1980s and 1990s, covering wars in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and the South Caucasus region. And finally, Dov Zakai is vice president, uh, vice chairman of the center's board of directors. He served as Undersecretary of Defense uh, in the George W. Bush administration and had a direct role in planning and executing the early phases of the war in Afghanistan. I will note for our live audience that you have a question icon at the bottom of your Zoom screens that you can use to pose questions. And I'm going to begin our discussion today with a question of my own. Uh, the focus of this panel is on the future, on what Afghanistan is likely to look like after the U.S. withdrawal is completed uh, and America's on-the-ground role is diminished and new dynamics in, in the country and the surrounding region take shape. We want to anticipate what might be coming down the road and uh, how that might affect U.S. interests and what we ought to be doing to deal with these challenges. But to know where we might be heading, it's critical to understand a little bit about how we've arrived at this point. So I wanna to turn to Milt Bearden and, and ask him to provide a little bit of historical background, looking back to Afghanistan's role in the attacks on 9-11 in 2001, and on our history with the various players in Afghanistan. Milt, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, George. Uh, yes, uh, in the beginning, uh, there was Osama bin Laden. Everything begins in our Afghanistan adventure with bin Laden. But you have to understand that uh, this goes back to uh, the Gulf War when, when the Saudis uh, ejected Osama bin Laden uh, and sent him off to Sudan. And he spent the next four years there uh, brooding and watching America uh, uh, operating in the Gulf uh, and, until the Americans uh, were looking at improving relations with the Sudanese who were desperate to get out from underneath so many of the sanctions we had imposed on them. So we went to the Sudanese and said, look, a good first step uh, of getting out of the doghouse with America would be to get rid of bin Laden. Uh, he was under the protection of the spiritual leader of Sudan at that time, Hassan al-Tarabi. But I, in fact, carried a message to Khartoum, to both Omar Bashir, who was president, and to Hassan al-Tarabi, who I might have known uh, for, for years, and said, it's the bin Laden thing. Why don't you get him out of here? Uh, they went to bin Laden and said, uh, where would you like to go? Uh, uh, back to Saudi Arabia? No, the Saudis said, not on your life. He's not coming here. Uh, the Sudanese came to us and said, we'll give him to you. And uh, we said, we don't have anything to charge him with. So we don't want him either. Uh, and uh, the Sudanese said, well, we'll just keep him here under a tight leash. And the American position was, no, we can't do that. Uh, you've got to get him out of there. So they came back and said, he said he'd go to Somalia. That would be okay with you? Well, no, it wouldn't be okay. And finally, the Sudanese came to us and said, 
How about Afghanistan? The American position was that is so far away that it's perfect. Send bin Laden to Afghanistan. So in 1996, out of Sudan and off to Afghanistan to Jalalabad, which at that time had not yet fallen to the Taliban. And he, he, he linked up, I think, with his old friend, uh, uh, Abdul Russell Sayaf. And uh, later, when the Taliban took over in that part of Afghanistan, they, they, they more or less celebrated uh, having bin Laden there. And the rest uh, becomes history because he plotted, along with uh, some boys in Hamburg and New Jersey, and the next thing we have is 9-11. But this was not something that was entirely accidental. We were involved in <coughs> all the way back uh, to the time that, uh, you know, the, the very early 90s when he was in Sudan. And I think that's an important part of the history that we should understand as, as we move forward uh, here, rather than always saying, that Afghanistan provided a safe haven to terrorists because that's part of the current doc, uh, discussion now. Will they again provide a safe haven to terrorists? Well, they provided one uh, at our insistence back in 1996. So I'd like to just lay that out there as uh, a set of facts uh, that we can bear in mind as we go forward and take a look at the future. Thanks, Milt. Um, Cheryl, uh... Milt has brought up this question of the Taliban uh, providing a safe haven for terrorists and, and what it was that drew us militarily into Afghanistan back after 9-11, 20 years ago. Um, you have uh, done a lot of work on trying to understand the Taliban. Uh, you have a fascinating article in uh, the National Interest that's up on our site right now that attempts to, to figure out what does the Taliban want? And to what degree do the, the nice words that we hear uh, coming from them match their actual deeds in practice and what that might mean for prospects of a renewed terrorist threat coming out of, of, of Afghanistan? Can you talk a little bit about uh, your perspective on this problem? Sure. So what I'm hoping will happen, although it's not looking good for that right now, is that we start focusing on on facts and you know objective things that we actually know because if you look back over the last 20 years at a bit of a distance what i think you see is that we spent 20 years on wishful thinking guided by wishful thinking and and self-deception then we spent two years on damage control and the whole thing is now concluding in a month of panic and hysteria and that's really not a very good way to conduct one's foreign policy. We knew throughout those 20 years that there was massive corruption that was wrecking any sort of nation building we wanted to do in Afghanistan. We also knew all the problems that existed with the Afghan army. There was 20 years worth of covering that up. We knew that there were ghost soldiers that didn't really exist, that the army wasn't really a committed fighting force, that the officers also were corrupt and were stealing the salaries of their soldiers. We knew all of this, but we tried to put a good face on it, hoping that eventually it would turn around and be good. And actually one of the, I guess, amusing things about the current debate is how people who were like right in the middle of all that and able to shape and guide it, like General Petraeus or McMaster, are now like appearing on the talk shows like they knew they know better and they know exactly what the solutions are. Well, they had every chance to, to conduct those solutions and to, and to shape that, that outcome when they were there. So they have a bit of explaining to do on how that happened. But the Taliban, as far as the Taliban are concerned, so we have, we have a two year experience on, are they capable of keeping their promises? And they promised us that if we withdrew our forces, they didn't attack us. And for two years, that is exactly what they did. We have had no casualties inflicted by the Taliban for two years now, which is quite something, actually. That's a long period of time. So we know that much. They say that they are not the same as they were the last time around, that they've learned their lessons, that they've changed, that they understand what the international community expects from them, what the red lines are of that international community, and that they intend to respect them because they feel that they are dependent on economic relationships and they don't want to be a rogue state again. Is that true? Far too soon to come to any judgment on that. This is a fog of war situation right now. 
that in part we brought about or at least accelerated because that panic and hysteria that you can see at the airport was induced by a series of mistakes that we made on the ground. We evacuated the embassy. We closed Bagram Air Base, which should have been the last thing to close. We, we hastily and giving this feeling that the US expected you know, blood to be running in the streets any minute, we whisked out everybody out of our embassy and shut it down. Meanwhile, the Russians are leaning back and sitting pretty and being guarded by Taliban guards and keeping their embassy open. We issued two visa programs, the second of which had completely unrealistic criteria that the people in that P, the P2 visa, the people would have been required to apply from outside of the country where they couldn't get because at that point, the borders were already being guarded by the, and under the control of the Taliban. And they would have had to wait there with no assistance, as they were informed, for possibly a year until their case was reviewed. So if I were them, I would say, well, that's not really an avenue. I better get myself to the airport. So this, this was induced by us. And we really need to, everybody needs to take a deep breath, calm down, figure out how to evaluate the situation, and figure out what our strategic interest and our ethical and moral interest is in that country and how we can, under the present circumstances, not under some sort of imaginary circumstances that we could have created two years or three years or 10 years ago, under the current circumstances, how we can formulate a policy that optimizes our goals. Dove, uh, Cheryl has talked about America's strategic interests in Afghanistan, figuring out what those are, putting together a realistic approach for defending those interests. I'd like you to, to go back to those, uh, those hectic weeks after 9-11 in 2001 and talk about how the United States saw its strategic interests as they related to Afghanistan then. And I want you to, to, to uh, address whether you think U.S. interests have changed in the intervening 20 years. Or should we still be guided by the, the same interests that, uh, that we perceived back then? today? Well, let me first say that uh, I tend to agree with quite a bit of what Cheryl just said. Not all of it, but some of it. And uh, I'll go back to uh, 2001. Uh, I was actually out of the country on 9-11. We got back on 9-12. There were a whole bunch of undersecretaries, assistant secretaries who were out of the country on 9-11 flown back on military air because we had to meet with the president at the Pentagon on uh, six o'clock on the 12th. Well, the president made it very clear that unless the Taliban was gonna give up bin Laden and his crew, which he didn't anticipate the Taliban would do, we were gonna go to war, which we did. Now, what then happened was, and this has been reported over and over again, it wasn't long after we went to war that uh, there were a number of people who were pushing to go to war with Iraq. We hadn't even finished the job yet in Afghanistan. And one of the principal sources of evidence that I personally have is that at the time, although I had a policy background, I was actually the comptroller. I was in charge of the budget. And yet I was asked, to be the coordinator for Afghanistan because my counterpart, the undersecretary for policy was focusing on Iraq. And so it became immediately clear to me that Afghanistan was no longer a priority. Now, when I went out there in 2002, 2003, 2004, we had just started training. It was obvious that these uh, potential soldiers uh, in the Afghan army had no idea of how we fought, but we were trying to teach them how to fight. Uh, on the other hand, they weren't yet the evidence uh, that Cheryl talks about of corruption. That came later. Uh, and there's no doubting that a couple of million Afghans came back to Afghanistan in those first couple of years. Shops were opening up. Uh, people were going around Kabul without the kind of protection that everybody had to get later. My own son went to Kabul to see if he could do any business in 03, and he just wandered around the town. Within a few years, it became clear though, that first of all, there was a ton of corruption. I was on uh, the commission that looked at contracting in Afghanistan. We 
started out believing that it was the contractors that were wasting money. It turned out it was the government that just wasn't overseeing the contractors at all, which made a lot of sense because they were focusing on Iraq. Contractors didn't have guidance. They were getting automatic renewals. Subcontractors were siphoning money off right and left. And so the corruption built on itself. When we could have stopped it, there are some people, uh, Sarah Chase, for instance, who was out there for at least 10 years, points to an Obama decision in 2011 to basically ignore the corruption so we could keep going. Whether she's right or wrong, whether 2011 is the right date, I don't know. But it was clear by then, as Cheryl says, that there was just corrupt, the place was rife with corruption and you can't expect soldiers who in any event are fighting with weapons that they never really had before, with training that they've never fully absorbed because the contractors had absolutely no incentive to hand over to the, 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 to basically train them so they could hand over maintenance to them. They didn't have the maintenance. They needed the contractors till, till now, actually. Um, there, there was just none of this going on. And so you couldn't expect the troops to continue to fight. Uh, think of the czarist armies in uh, World War I, you know, eventually you had a revolution and the soldiers didn't shoot at their own people. So, you know, the combination of corruption, of poor training, uh, pretty much as Cheryl has laid out. What I don't entirely accept and where I think there is a difference between us is that, first of all, the deal that was cut with the Taliban was cut 15 months ago. And as Cheryl says, nobody was shooting at us for two years. So it's not obvious to me that that's why the Taliban didn't shoot, because it wasn't clear that we had reached the deal until we actually reached it. Um, maybe the Taliban was afraid we would retaliate. Maybe they're still afraid. There are F-18s flying over Afghanistan. So, you know, can we trust the Taliban? I don't know that we can trust them anymore that we trusted them in 2001. I think the way we're coming out is a complete mess. It needn't have been done that way. I think as whatever you think about Biden's decision, personally, I think it was the wrong decision, but regardless, once he made that decision to pull out by a given date, that's when he should have started the process of getting our people out. The fact that Ashraf Ghani told him not to do it, given what we knew about the corruption in Afghanistan, why did he listen to Ghani? And now we have the mess we have. Going forward, I think the fundamental issue is this. How do we ensure that they don't welcome Al-Qaeda back? They don't need us. They've got the Chinese. They've got the Russians. They may even have the Iranians. They'll get money. It's just like we say we, are, we isolate the Iranians and so on, but they're not really all that isolated. Will there be training camps the size of the ones that I saw in Afghanistan? The Al-Qaeda training camps? I don't know. But even if they are, it's going to be awfully hard to knock them out with bombers flying from somewhere in the Gulf. It's a thousand miles. It's a long flight. How do we make sure that we hit our targets? We weren't very good at hitting our targets before. We knocked out hospitals. We knocked out weddings. So that's not clear to me. And in that respect, I totally agree with Cheryl. The last place we should have left was Bagram if we had left it at all. If we wanted to keep the Taliban on their toes, we should have been in Bagram so that we could hit them very, very quickly without them having the kind of warning that would allow them to, to scatter and then we'd miss our targets. Why don't I stop there? Bill, uh, do you have a comment on uh, remarks to, to this point? Yeah, I do. Uh, there's a, uh, another tiny bit of history. Uh, before we invaded in, in uh, October, of uh, 2001, I got a call from um, uh, the Taliban foreign minister, Mutawakil, uh, his guy, who had a message for me. He said, that man is no longer under our protection. And then he repeated it two more times. Do you understand? And I said, yeah, I get it. Uh, you're saying this guy uh, is not under your protection. So we know where everybody is in Afghanistan. So you're just saying, go get him and we'll go over and uh, play some Buskashi somewhere. 
Uh, so, in fact, before the invasion, which they knew was coming, uh, they wanted to signal to us that we should just go in and snatch bin Laden, and then that, that would take care of the, the invasion. I called uh, the Bush administration at an appropriate level and was told, well, that's a nice start. Uh, it was clear to me that uh, the uh, Bush administration was going to go to war, and they didn't want to be bothered by anything like that, which was much more complicated to them uh, than actually invading Afghanistan, which uh, turned out to be a little bit more complicated after all. But I think we ought to understand that uh, the Taliban were ready uh, to turn uh, to turn in any other direction and let us get bin Laden. That's a, a fascinating uh, bit of history. Um, I want to turn to uh, to Anatole, who has a lot of experience on the ground in the region, not just in Afghanistan, in Pakistan as well, a key player in all of this. Anatole, how do you see things uh, developing in uh, Afghanistan and in the surrounding region in, in the coming uh, months? Uh, a lot of the, the covers that I'm seeing about this issue is uh, assuming that uh, Taliban control of the country is more or less inevitable. Uh, is that how you see that, or are the dynamics a little more complicated than that? Well, I think that that may be one reason why I would never say trust the Taliban. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, uh, and I, I expect that Mr. Zahim will agree, uh, I, I never trusted uh, any of our side uh, in Afghanistan either, um, especially having observed them over the years, of course. I mean, some of them, yes, but many, I mean, would you trust Vice President Dostum, for example? Uh, but uh, the thing about um, having some confidence in Taliban promises in future uh, is precisely the fact that on key issues, uh, all the countries of the region, with a certain question mark over, over India, uh, are on the same side. Uh, and they are all of them, of course, deeply opposed to the idea of Afghanistan becoming a base for international terrorism, uh, because, I mean, admittedly different groups, but uh, they threaten them. Uh, not just Russia, obviously, um, but Iran, uh, China, the Uyghurs, and Pakistan, uh, interestingly enough, because the Pakistani Taliban, who were driven over the border by the Pakistan army, have moved to Afghanistan and largely joined ISIS. So the Pakistanis are very anxious that the Taliban should suppress them. They, all of them, by the way, see ISIS as the, the principal threat now. Uh, and they, all of them, um, hope that it will be possible uh, through a mixture, of course, of bribes and influence and at least the threat of pressure uh, to keep the Taliban to the promises that they have made uh, to, um, uh, well, as Milt said about the Sudanese, uh, not necessarily to hand over people like Al-Qaeda, but to keep them on a tight leash. And I think that the, uh, by the way, the Taliban have also promised again to suppress heroin. They've made that promise in Tehran and Moscow, uh, as well as to us. Uh, though of course, only in if you know, the farmers are compensated. Uh, but you see, if the Taliban were to break their promises on this, because now we're in a completely different position regionally from the where, uh, where we were in, um, in 2001. You know, all the regional countries uh, uh, are willing to deal with the Taliban, um, but of course, uh, on condition that Taliban promises are kept. If the Taliban breaks these promises, it will find itself completely isolated in the region, cut off from the sea by Iran and Pakistan, but also at that point, uh, pack, uh, the Taliban would face a threat of internal rebellion backed by external players, just as they did before 9-11. The Russians, the Iranians would be backing the anti-Taliban opposition. I don't think that the Taliban can afford that. Uh, if, so if, they, if the Taliban keep to their promises, there will undoubtedly be internal opposition in Afghanistan, but I don't think that it will have sufficient support uh, to pose a major threat to the Taliban. The wild card is India, which is much more anti-Taliban than the others and has only 
you know, begun to um, talk to the Taliban very <coughs> recently. Uh, of course, they will expect the Taliban to make the same promises about anti-Indian terrorists, Lashkar-e Taiba, and so forth, that they've made to the rest of us about Al Qaeda, the Uyghurs, the ISIS, and so on. Uh, so, of course, we, we'll have to see. But I think that uh, the key to controlling Taliban behavior has to be the region. And after all, there is a, a, you know, a deeper reason for that, right? I mean, America has been heavily involved in Afghanistan in one way or another with interruptions for about 43 years or so, admittedly, went away again in the, um, in the 1990s. Uh, Iran has been involved in Afghanistan for not much more than 2,500 years. Pakistan will be involved with Afghanistan as long as Pakistan and Afghanistan exist, because they're next door to each other, ditto to a considerable extent Russia and China. So I think um, that the, the region uh, has to be the key in the end. And uh, for that reason, I, I think that uh, we you know, can be, shall I say, cautiously optimistic uh, about future Taliban external behavior, cautiously. And I think to be fair, because we've all been dumping on the foreign policy and the State Department administration, but to be fair, one of the positive things they have done over the past two years is to work very hard to bring the region into some sort of an accord in regard to what Afghanistan should look like and to sort of harp on what those shared interests are that you've just very well described and, and laid out. And you know, if I may, I'd like to say also that we, what I really hope we do is stop operating on the basis of assumptions, because it has time and again led us into completely wrong directions. I never understood, for example, more or less from the beginning, this thought we had that, oh, we have to train the Afghan army and we have to teach the Afghans how to fight. It really, it doesn't seem like the Taliban need us to teach them how to fight. These are the, exactly the same Afghans. I mean, how does this make sense at all? How does it make sense that, that one group of Afghans can fight with you know, small numbers, poor equipment and everybody after them fight excellently. And this other group that has, as President Biden correctly described, you know, luxurious amounts of equipment and everything we can possibly give them and they can't fight. Well, obviously there's something wrong with our assumptions there. And similarly, the second assumption that I'm almost more worried about is, so everybody is now worried, oh, Afghanistan's going to become a haven for terrorism again. And how are we going to prevent this? No one seems to be worrying about these tens of thousands of people that we are rushing out of the country and into the US. And because we're so, so hysterical about this and the press is, oh, the, you know, we have to get our allies and our friends out. Yeah, sure, but those tens of thousands are not necessarily, even in the majority, our friends and allies, these people are not being vetted because we're so desperate to look better in the press and to put them all on the planes, get them off the tarmac, get them out, and then once they're in our planes, they have to be able to come to the West and to the US largely. And I, 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 I was looking up yesterday, one of the big problems we had with the Afghan military was the green on blue attacks. These are attacks where your supposed fellow soldiers from that country shoot you in the back basically, well not basically, literally, they, they, they're in your office or in your team or in your squadron, and they literally shoot you in the back because they are infiltrators. So there was a, you know, by 2018, there had been over 200 green on blue attacks, which is an extraordinarily high number for a situation like that. And finally, the army uh, committed a study on that. And the study found that the, one of the big reasons for this was that we weren't, we were so anxious to get lots of soldiers because we wanted good numbers of, oh, the army is growing, the Afghan army is growing in size, that we didn't vet this, these soldiers. We just took anybody who showed up at the recruiting center or anyone that one could slap a uniform on, we took them to bolster these numbers. Again, a problem of the contractors, which, which has been highlighted by my colleagues today. We need to vet people. We can't bring them to the US without knowing who they are. We are literally bringing people who have no documents at all, no identity papers. The administration is claiming that we vet everybody and we're gonna do biometric. How are you gonna do biometrics on somebody who is in no sort of a system? You don't have anything to compare it to. You have somebody who doesn't, you don't even know what their name is, who they are. The translators, of course, we have, we have them registered. We have the US citizens, hopefully registered. We have the people who were in sensitive positions and who probably are best to remove from any potential danger, we have them. But we also have just 
thousands of people who stormed the airport and refused to leave and who ultimately, in order to calm the situation down, we flew out without knowing who they are. This is going to, I'm very worried about what the consequences of that are going to be. And we're going to, you know, act in haste, repent at leisure. Can I just add to that? But of course, another colossal problem we've had with our Afghan allies uh, has been heroin dealing. Um, you know, everybody has talked about the, the Taliban as major heroin dealers. They tax the trade undoubtedly, but so many of the kingpins in the heroin trade were on our side. They were government ministers and generals. Um, and now, well, they're going to be coming to us as well. Bill, you have a thought? Uh, yeah, I think that... Uh, Can I jump in here for a minute? About, about what the future of the Taliban would be uh, must include their understanding of the uh, mineral resources in Afghanistan. Over the last 10 years, uh, we have uh, really taken a hard look at what's underground there. And uh, it is indeed a treasure chest. Uh, some of the, the uh, 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 people I worked with on that uh, project called it the last treasure chest on earth. The Taliban know exactly uh, what we found. They have all of our reports. And so uh, does China. So that's going to be part of the game in the future. This is Taliban 2.0 or, or 3.0. And the last time they took over, they just took over uh, the same old Afghanistan. This time they've taken over what they also believe is a treasure chest. Well, on that subject, I, I wanna delve into this a little bit more because um, you all have, have indicated that when it comes to counterterrorism, um, the great powers and regional powers with the possible exception of India are all on the same page. They don't wanna see uh, Taliban controlled Afghanistan become once again a haven for terrorism, a base for international terrorist attacks. But when it comes to this question of uh, mineral wealth, uh, resources in Afghanistan, uh, energy, transportation, um, are they on the same page or are there points of friction that, that might begin to emerge between China, for example, India, Pakistan, and Russia? Well, I mean, tension between Pakistan and India will always be there. That's a given. Um, Pakistan and China, of course, are very much on the same page, I think. Uh, China has made the huge paper commitments to invest in Afghanistan, uh, both in energy in northern Afghanistan and in the huge INAC. Uh, copper mine. Uh, the Pakistanis hope to benefit from that by because the it will have to be shipped out via Pakistan. And um, they hope not just to gain revenue from that, but also to tie uh, Afghanistan into Pakistan's transport network and thereby, you know, almost ensure Afghanistan as a sort of Pakistani dependency. Um, I don't think that uh, any of this in principle worries the Iranians, because after all, they were also seeking a closer relationship with the Chinese. Um, what the Iranians are worried about and what they've been, you know, uh, demanding insistently from uh, the Taliban is that the Taliban should not allow the Saudis to use Afghanistan as a base for attacking Iran. Um, but uh, that involves a very complicated set of, of issues in that region. Um, but uh, I think as far as uh, the others are concerned, once again, India is to some extent the odd man out because of the, the bitterness of the Indo-Pakistan relationship and Indo-Chinese relationship. As far as the others are concerned, I don't think that one will see major international rivalry uh, over the, um, over the uh, investment in the Afghan economy. At least that's what, George, what you what you bring up is important, though, because they may or may not be rivals with each other, but they're definitely rivals with us. And, and as, a, as a little footnote to INOC, people may not know this, um, but but you you mentioned that I'm with a cultural heritage protection organization. So INOC is a huge copper deposit, but it also is co-located co with essentially Afghanistan's Pompeii. There's a gigantic mm -hmm archeological site there, which is an underground, huge sprawling Buddhist city with multiple temples and stupas and things that could be excavated and that actually could be protected while you're also doing mining because you need the, the revenue, but not if you're gonna go in like China and try to do the cheapest possible form of mining and create an open pit mine. So that's one thing that my organization is very concerned about. But 
I think the bottom line is, you know, if we're going to hastily leave completely, we're going to assume the worst about the Taliban and not even try to shape the situation for the better by staying engaged with them, then we're going to hand it off to countries who definitely don't care about things like freedom of expression, freedom of journalistic uh, you know, endeavors, women's rights, human rights. I mean, really, Iran and China, you're going you're gonna to leave the terrain to them to try and shape what kind of a society Afghans have to live in. And we're thinking, oh, who wants to want to leave? What about the ones who have to stay? Uh, you know, George, um, George, go ahead, Dove. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, uh, on, on the um, no, let's let let Dove have the floor for a second here. Then we'll turn to you. Yeah, I've had some trouble connecting, but so I'd like to make a few comments first. Uh, I agree that the pressure from the neighbors will keep the Taliban under some degree of control, no question. But remember, just about all of those neighbors don't really care if terrorists go after the West of the United States. They don't want terrorists to go after China if they happen to be uh, the government in Beijing. They don't want terrorists to make trouble for Russia if they happen to be the government in Moscow. But it's not clear to me that the Taliban is going to be particularly concerned about mollifying the United States. Cheryl talks about assumptions. Well, it's a hell of an assumption that for some reason, all of a sudden, the Taliban are going to listen to Washington and, being, and will be nice to women and Hazaras uh, and not destroy uh, cultural artifacts the way they did the Buddhas some, you know, many years ago. It just seems to me that we need to be much more careful about what we're prepared to believe about the Taliban. They're being very nice now until we get out. Then what happens? I think we need to be very, very uh, clear to ourselves that this is not a group that is going to pay much attention to us. They're not going to go beyond their borders. They, they didn't in the 80s and 90s. They're not going to do it now. That's not their interest. But their interest really is to impose Sharia law, they've already announced it. And I don't know how Sharia law, as imposed by a Wahhabi group, which is essentially what they are, or Salafis, if you want to call them that, uh, are going to be all of a sudden willing to let women get their educations. This is not Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. This is a very different group. And I think realism is called for, but realism all around. I, I'm sorry, I have to jump in. So first of all, I'm not assuming that they're going to be great. I think I clearly said that what we should do is wait and assess on the basis of facts and remain in dialogue with them, because if you're not in dialogue with them, you definitely have no opportunity to shape their behavior or even to monitor it properly. Their behavior so far, there have been positive indications. For example, the Shia minority, which has been subjected to regular violence under the Afghan government, not by them, but under them, was able to hold its Ashura celebration in Mazari Sharif for the first time this year without violence because the Taliban guarded it. Uh, a hopeful sign, maybe just a PR move, I don't know, but nonetheless, why not encourage the good? That's an Islamic principle. Encourage the good, discourage the bad. Uh, they also issued several orders for the protection of cultural heritage sites and against looting, one quite recently, because they're worried about the treasures of the country getting out of the country. I'm sorry, I must disagree with you, Dov. They're not Wahhabi or Salafi. They're, they're sort of nationalist fundamentalists, um, and, and they're, 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 not, they're nothing like the Wahhabis at all. They would, for example, never destroy an Islamic monument or an Islamic site. What one worries about is the pre-Islamic part of that. But I think, you know, I think we should all, we should read Barbara Tuchman, The March of Folly, to see how one can march into a situation and for no good reason, turn a possible good outcome into a terrible outcome and a complete loss. And we should read Machiavelli and, and be a little bit more pragmatic. Well, let's, uh, let me just come back very briefly, which is to say, um, how do you know the Taliban's gonna wanna talk to us once we're out? You don't know. Uh, no, and if I don't we know, but I won't, I won't, if we, we don't talk to them, we won't ever find please out. Let, please let me finish. I heard you out. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. I would like the courtesy that I gave you. We don't know that. What we do know is that there are killings going on, that the young women are being uh, once again 
engage the Taliban people that are two or three times their age. We know that too, but that's not at the airport. That's not directly affecting Americans. Um, let's not paint these people as all of a sudden having moderated. We have no evidence they've moderated. They've done a couple, even as you said, a couple of PR stunts. I don't, if I were a Hazara, I would be very worried right now because in a year's time, when the West isn't paying attention to Afghanistan anymore, I very much doubt that it'll just be assured that they'll be allowed to have. And so it, it just seems to me, you wanna be realistic, that's fine, but don't make assumptions either. Sorry, can I jump in there? It's not, as far as the Shia are concerned, it's not a question of promises to us. It's a question of promises to Iran. You know, we, we mustn't go on with this business of thinking that everything revolves around us. Um, it's Iran that has uh, demanded uh, assurances about treatment of the Shia, obviously, and has received them. Now, maybe the Taliban won't, uh, won't keep those promises, uh, but if it doesn't, uh, then it will pay a very heavy price at the hands of Iran in terms of support for uh, rebel groups against the Taliban as for 9-11. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the, there are multiple points of pressure from different angles on the Taliban. But as, as far as everything they do, of course, I mean, we will have to see. We should, we should be, be cautious and we should certainly not do anything for them or give anything to them until we have had a, had a chance to see how they, how they develop. Let me uh, interject here and uh, note that we have several questions in from audience members. And uh, I want to uh, begin with one from Paul Hare, who's uh, a senior fellow here at the center. He asked, why is the Taliban insisting that Biden not extend the withdrawal operation? Does it believe the US will simply abandon anyone who is not evacuated by August 31st? And would it not serve the Taliban's interest to allow and facilitate the withdrawal? Would it rather antagonize Washington and seek a working relationship with the United States? Who would well, like let to? Me, let me crack at that. Um, if I were the Taliban, I would insist on the August 31st, the September 1st deadline for the simple reason that Biden keeps repeating it. Why should the Taliban be softer on the deadline than Joe Biden? Um, now, if Biden decides he's going to extend it, that becomes a, a dilemma for the Taliban. And do they go along with it or not? If they want to project that moderate image that some people believe they, well, everybody believes they have the moderate image now, whether they're really moderate is another issue. If they want to project that image, then they go along with him. But let him make the first move. Right now, he keeps insisting that August 31st is a drop dead date. Why, if you're the Taliban, should you turn around and say, well, no, uh, we're going to allow it even later. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me, at least. I don't think it's an unreasonable principle in international relationships for people to expect that one's agreements are going to be stuck to. So I don't see anything extremely peculiar about them saying, this is our agreement and we want you to stick to it. We conversely are going to expect them to stick to their agreements too, aren't we? Mill? Well, I, I think that uh, you know, if we, in fact, have to have some extra time to get some Americans out, the Taliban are going to let us extend. But I agree with everybody else. They're going to they're going to stand by their agreement at this point. What have they got to lose? Absolutely nothing. Uh, they're in, in, a, in, a, in a much stronger position. The only other thing I might interject here is that, look, 20 years, I mean, the Taliban I know all have iPhones. They want iPhone 12s. They, they, they've been exposed to all of that. They, they, they know in the intervening 20 years that they do have a treasure chest. I think, and they have uh, reached out to me on this, that after the shooting is over, they would like to see Americans in Afghanistan involved in uh, the the development of their mineral resources as well. Maybe that's just to draw us in. I mean, uh, we have to give the Taliban some credit for possibly being uh, clever and uh, maybe even in some cases smarter than a lot of us. And I think uh, that they will uh, play that game very carefully. And, uh, and, and my sense is that they will uh, try to have us somehow be around after this game is 
this phase of the game is over. Can I just throw in one, one sentence there? I never talk about moderate Taliban, but I do quite often talk about pragmatic Taliban. And uh, I think some of them have, in the past uh, and today have also shown they can be pragmatic. And they're in a difficult neighborhood. They might want alternative points of contact as well. Look, I, you can't rule it out, I agree. I mean, after all said and done, uh, that's what happened with Vietnam. Uh, um, but it's going to take time, it took 20 years with Vietnam for us to recognize them and then to recognize us and all that. Uh, but look, we just have to wait and see. Is this the same? Everybody says this may not be the same Taliban it was 20 odd years ago. Well, by definition, it isn't. Leaders have changed. Some of the, the uh, uh, secondary and tertiary leadership has changed, of course, um, but it ain't going to happen quickly. And uh, we just need to see where they are, watch developments. And I would only recommend reaching out once we have a better sense of where they are. I think uh, premature uh, efforts to do so, um, we might regret later, but let's see where they are. But don't forget that until a couple of years ago, the tallest building in Ho Chi Minh City was Citibank. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, but it took uh, quite a while for that to happen. And in the meantime, by the way, as you know very well, Milt, uh, the, the Vietnamese fought a war with China um, not long after we left and, and actually gave them a bloody nose. We just have to see how the Taliban plays their internal game. And frankly, uh, and here I don't disagree with Cheryl at all, their external game. Uh, but right now, I suspect also the mood of the United States public is going to be to walk away from this entirely. So, well, I mean, I, I would have to, I, I entirely agree, and I think that would be a terrible mistake. Um, I, I also think we mustn't confuse, as I'm afraid America so often does, helping people with talking to people. I would entirely agree that we mustn't give the Taliban any help at all until we see how they develop. Uh, but that doesn't stop us going on talking to them and you know uh trying to find out how they see things um because if we if we make talking to them conditional on concessions and so forth frankly well yes then it will take 20 years or 30 or or 40 or whatever you know i think there we we can learn um you know from from people in in the region uh you don't trust you don't give people anything um until they prove themselves but you do go on talking Anatole, I really liked your term, uh, the pragmatic, the pragmatists in the Taliban. And I guess the other side would be the ideologues in the, in the Taliban mm -hmm. that we need. And that is the split that I would personally be very worried about because I think that right now, probably the pragmatists are more or less in charge, but that's going to be a delicate balance. And yeah. here's where I'm a little bit unsure. I'd like to know what you think. You're saying we shouldn't help them, but at the same time, if that country totally tanks because you know they're having a looming humanitarian crisis already there's shortages of medicine there's shortages of food the who is worrying about this they're running out of medication all the ngos or most of the ngos have left so a lot of the services that kept the poorer areas and the rural areas afloat are gone now if you know if that turns into a huge humanitarian catastrophe then that's going to be bad for the pragmatists and good for the ideologues, but how do we help the people without helping the Taliban? I'm, I'm curious what you would think about that. I suppose, as we've done in other cases, basic humanitarian aid, um, you know, directed at the population in general. You know, we have given that, after all, to a number of countries whose uh, regimes we deeply disapproved of, uh, or we have, you know, not stopped the United Nations from doing so, um, but nothing beyond that. Would be my yeah, I'm with Anatoly on that. First of all, uh, I've never believed that you shouldn't talk to everybody. Uh, if you don't talk to people, you have no idea what's going on. So uh, I'm in agreement with that. But also, you know, there are ways of helping inside Afghanistan and working around the Taliban. There's no question. Uh, we do that elsewhere. Uh, Haiti is a good example. I mean, who really wants to work with the Haitian, with the Haitian government that's been corrupt since forever? But we have organizations that work on the ground, that work around the government. Uh, there are other countries that have excellent access 
to Afghanistan and that the Taliban tolerates. Uh, Turkey is a great example. They've been working there for a long, long time uh, and they haven't had any trouble. So it seems to me that if we're a little bit clever about this, maybe working indirectly as opposed to directly, uh, uh, maybe making sure that the assistance we give isn't really assistance that AID is giving to contractors and that's where it ends, um, we could work around the government. So I, I take what Anatoly says and agree with it with the proviso that we're a little bit smarter about aid than we've sometimes been. So uh, several of you have brought up Vietnam uh, in the course of this discussion, and I want to raise this directly, and it relates to something that uh, Paul Starobin has, uh, has asked. Um, he asks, is, is Afghanistan the final nail in the coffin for the idea of America as the global policeman? And I want to extend that question a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what happened to the United States and its role in the world after the Vietnam War ended, because we went into a, a period that many refer to as the post-Vietnam syndrome period, where we were quite wary of uh, international military commitments and involvement. Uh, some say the pendulum might have swung a little bit too far in the direction of, of reticence. Uh, is that a danger for the United States in the, the post-Afghanistan withdrawal period? How do you think we ought to approach this? Uh, you know, can we strike a balance between too much uh, involvement on the one hand or, or not enough on the other hand? Let me try that because I was in the Reagan administration, which had to deal with that in a very real way. Um, as you know, we had a couple of minor operations, uh, went into Grenada, went into Lebanon. Reagan was smart enough to realize Lebanon was going nowhere. And so he got out. I think we called it a strategic realignment or something like that. Um, but the bottom line is we got out. Uh, and of course, you overhanging that, you had the Cold War. You still had the Soviet Union. And Reagan took measure of Gorbachev, partly thanks to Mrs. Thatcher. And um, we are who we are with the end of the Cold War. What we have now is, I think that if the United States is serious as intending to remain the leader of quote unquote, the free world, it's got to show that free world that it's doing something or enough things to maintain that leadership. So for example, let, let me be specific. And here I'm wearing my old budget hat. We have a program called the European Deterrence Initiative. It's very, very important particularly to the countries of Eastern Europe uh, and Central Europe. We cut that budget this year. To me, that's not a signal of leadership. We have a, a, a program called the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which is important to Japan, Korea, even Taiwan, Southeast Asia. What we did with that one was take money from other programs that we were spending on anyway and call it the initiative. That doesn't really reassure people. So if we want to, in a sense, do what Reagan did, which is to go beyond Vietnam and focus on the big stuff and not get caught up in trying to be the policeman everywhere in the world and recognizing that there are times when you shouldn't even have gone in in the first place as he recognized with Lebanon, then we need to do more in those areas where the leadership really counts. Because right now, we all know our allies are really nervous about us. And they're not nervous about Biden per se. It's Biden, it's Trump, it's the 2016 election when the last four candidates were all against free trade. They're worried about America and whether America as a country, as opposed to its leadership, is turning inward. If we don't want them to worry that way, then we have to do some things on the ground with our money, with our training, with our efforts, with the State Department, that shows that we're serious about leading. Otherwise, I think we're gonna have problems. And so, speaking as a European, if I could just put in there, I mean, a, a Brit, so I suppose maybe we're not Europeans anymore. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, uh, if I were an American uh, I, and some Europeans said to me, um, oh, I'm worrying about American leadership. I would say after your performance in Afghanistan, mates, we're worried about you. Um, you know, uh, I really sympathize with Americans who say that Europe is simply not stepping up. 
you know, to its to, to maintain its own security, um, and is not doing enough um, for America you know, in return for what America is 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 doing for Europe. I think you know Europe has to be. It is shameful that in private European officials admit that they couldn't even you know guarantee to control the Balkans if war broke out again there. I mean, on American leadership, I, I would also like to say that. Um, you know, America is trying to lead in all manner of places, you know, tried in Afghanistan, where it has had no strong historical role at all. Uh, meanwhile, parts of Central America, which are next door to the United States and are frankly going to hell, have been astonishingly neglected by the United States. Um, so, you know, if there's going to be a refocus of American leadership, I think there is, you know, a lot to be said for America you know, for its own sake, really concentrating on its own neighborhood um, and trying to frankly kick the Europeans into taking more responsibility for their neighborhood, which by the way also includes uh, Western Africa, uh, where, um, you know, Europeans made all these promises to help France and America and have done nothing. Sorry, a slightly sour comment about my own continent, but still. Well, we're kind of in mutual flagellation mode now in the US uh, in a bipartisan way, you know, but I think it's going to be better to do a, like an after action analysis very calmly. And I think we need to identify what we are not good at and should probably not do anymore as much in the future. We're not good at playing the long game. I mean, look at Russia. They ignominiously left Afghanistan. Uh, at the end of their venture, and now they're they're all cozily back, and they're chummy with the Taliban, and they're in their embassy, and they're talking about cooperation, and they're going to play a significant role in that country, you know, hopefully in a helpful way. We're not good at social engineering. We go into, as you said, societies that we know very little about, and we pr propose that we're going to completely transform them in you know a short amount of time and turn everything on its head. Uh, from, an, from an external actor point of view. We're not diabolical. Every time we try to be like super clever and manipulate other countries and work with tyrants and dictators, it ends very, very badly. So those are probably things we should not do. We're much better at economic diplomacy, building relationships that way, just being ourselves and, and having other people look to our culture and our Yes, our culture, even things like our, you know, our, our media, our social media have been very problematic in this uh, and have moved into censorship and far from journalistic freedom. But when we stick to what we're good at, then we play a much better role in the world. I would just simply say I totally agree with that. And I will give you a, a concrete example of, of why, in this case, Cheryl's 100%, maybe 1,000% right. <laughs> when I, no, but, but seriously, when I was undersecretary, I was asked to visit a girl's school in Mazari Sharif. I was asked to do that on a Friday. <laughs> and they made all the teachers and all the girls come out to greet the undersecretary. This is the one day that the teachers could get their catch their breath and the girls could play. Well, if that wasn't enough. The captain who was a civil affairs officer, or civil affairs officer, sees that the headmaster of the school, who's dressed in probably the only suit he has, has invited me to join him for lunch. And anybody who knows anything about Islam knows that hospitality is way up there in their culture. The captain turns around to this man and says, sorry, the undersecretary has to see the facility. He cannot join you for lunch. The guy almost died on the spot. So I said, Captain, take some of my staff and show them to the facility. I'm going to lunch. And wouldn't you have it? It was a banquet. This is a civil affairs officer who had no idea about the local culture. And remember, we've cycled people through. They go free two years or whatever, and then they're out. How do they learn about the culture? How do they know how to talk to you? You pull a kid out of Kansas or Nebraska or Oklahoma, send him or her out to, the, to Afghanistan and expect them to understand the culture? I mean, who are we kidding? So yeah, with, on this one, I'm totally with Cheryl. Well, Doug, I'm gonna give you the last word on this since we are fast approaching the witching hour for this discussion. It has been a fascinating very wide ranging uh, and, and very insightful discussion. I wanna thank all our panelists uh, for all of your comments today. 
as well as the audience for your attention and for your questions. And we'll look forward to our next uh, event for the Center for the National Interest. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you.